two, tonight we have uh, Ryan who's going to be speaking to us. Uh, a couple of things that I forgot to mention last night, and you know, you just forget it one time, and don't forget it again. Um, hopefully. But uh, just a couple things. There is stuff for the kids downstairs if it gets too much. I've heard that tonight's speaker isn't quite as winded as last night's was, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just right here. Um, now, um, but if you missed last night, you missed kind of like part one, so you're going to have to go back and kind of find us on Facebook and find the part one. Uh, really, really good stuff. Um, but there is stuff for K through fifth grade downstairs in the gym, and then anybody younger that, again, if it gets too much, you know, just sit back down this hallway for anybody under kindergarten, and then just down the stairs right off this door for kindergarten and above. So if you have friends that are like, I don't know if my kid can, you know, handle it all night, hey, let them know. We have child care provided. And then also, don't I don't want to forget to mention tonight that, um, you know, if any of this stuff that these guys are talking about this week, you want some extra resources to help you out, they do have some tables in the back that have some extra resources um, for you to be able to pick up at, you know, just at the cost. So, I mean, they're not giving them out, but um, with that being said, um, these guys have come, and really, the only thing that the church had to provide for these guys was what you see here on the stage. <coughs> so, um, I forgot to mention this yesterday, but if you would, um, if you want to donate to these guys and the efforts at um, the Creation Truth Foundation, not ministries, uh, if you want to... <laughs> thank you, Matt. If you want to uh, donate to these guys, you'll notice that on the back wall we have a black box it's for offering and prayer requests. Just stick that offering in there for those guys. Um, you know, they're doing this absolutely just because they love it. It's their ministry and they want us to know. They want people to know. You know, you don't have to listen to what your science teacher told you back in fifth grade. There's truth to it. And this thing here is chock full of truth. Yeah. And this should be our worldview. So I'm going to open us up with prayer, and then Ryan's going to come up, and he's going to talk to us tonight. Part two. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you. Thank you so much, God, that we are able to come to this place tonight. Father, that we're able to just uh, gather together as your church body. Father, we pray tonight, Lord, that you would just speak through your servant. God, that you would open up our hearts, that you would open up our minds. Father, and most importantly, you would open up our ears. Uh, to hear what is being presented before us. Father, I know uh, his heart is to just speak uh, that which you would have him speak. So, Father, we just pray again a blessing tonight upon Ryan as he speaks to us. Again, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you so much for your patience with us. And we thank you so much for your mercy. We pray all this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> well, now we know to always check the black boxes if there's a love on <laughs> <laughs> Well, good evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Ryan Cox. I am with Creation Truth Foundation, and I always have to start. This is my family. All right. They are not with me right now. They're going to actually be joining us this week as we go to uh, another event in northwestern Missouri. But that's my wife, Amanda, and then uh, my oldest, Justice, then Moriah, Galilee, Gideon, Titus, and Nathaniel, and me with all my Christmas St. Louis here, St. Louis Cardinals here. Amen? Amen. All right. Very good. Now you like me, don't you? All right. That's good. So, my background is history. I was a longtime history teacher. My degree is in history. I love studying history. And guess what my favorite history book is in all the world? I, I, I have this feeling that when you don't look at this, come at it with an approach with a little bit of a background that this is absolute, divinely inspired, 100% accurate history, you might miss a few things, and your worldview could be very skewed. I, I, I just love to tell people when I go places, uh, having studied history and having that kind of background, I can say with 100% assurance without a doubt in my mind that there is no more trustworthy history book than the Word of God. When you analyze the historical dependability of all other histories, of everything you, you read in any history book, if you actually look at where the sources are for that, where that history has come from, 
you compare it to the scripture and the reliability of how this has been handed down throughout the ages, you would come to find out that we're not as sure about the history we're so adamant about in history books as compared to the history handed down in this book. And I, I could spend a whole presentation on that. But what we're doing tonight is last night, Matt Miles, the president of our ministry, did a wonderful job, an excellent job of portraying to you the historical truth of the great global flood. About 42, 4,300 years ago, as recorded in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and part of 9. When something to that level of global catastrophe happens, might there be some residual effects? When you have your world turned upside down in such a manner, there will be adverse effects. And one of the things that we are asked about from time to time when talking about history and things that have happened in the past is we are asked about the, the, there it is, the Ice Age. The Ice Age. How does that come into play, in particularly with the Word of God? And so we want to look at a biblical perspective of that and the catastrophic climate change that took place with this event. To begin with, let's understand the non-biblical worldview of an ice age. The non-biblical idea of an ice age is that there have been several throughout history. There have been five major ice ages, and within each of those ice ages, there have been periods of glacial activity, glacial periods within those. A, an ice age is any time you have ice on the polar caps. So, when we look at this and the way it's presented in the modern secular uh, textbooks, we have these five major ones. The most recent one began 2.58 million years ago, and has it ended yet? Has it ended yet according to the secular definition of an ice age? No, because do we still have ice on the polar caps? Yes, we do. Therefore, we have not fully moved out of the current ice age. Now, we're not in a current glacial period according to this, but we have not finished the current major ice age because there's still ice on the polar caps. Not until they are completely gone have we moved out of the most recent ice age. Now think about that next time you watch the news. <laughs> it must be portrayed. So that, just keep that in your mind as we go through this. How do you get an ice age? That's a good question from a secular worldview. We've got to figure out how we came up with these five <coughs> different ice ages and what may have caused them. So, there are several ingredients that go into making an ice age if you're trying to make one up to fit your presuppositions of an ancient earth of billions of years old. And some of those things would include the orbital shape of our planet. If you see on the little diagram here, the little illustrations, we are not quite in a perfect circle orbiting the sun. We have a little bit of an ellipse to it. Part of one of the ingredients to get a secular ice age is that the farther away we are in that ellipse, the cooler the climate is. And that varies over time. We, sometimes we become more elliptical, sometimes we become more perfectly circle. Now, all we've ever observed is what we can see currently, and our orbit is currently becoming more and more back to perfectly circle again. Interesting little note. And there are cycles to that, they, so they believe. Another piece of the uh, puzzle is axial tilt, the obliquity. As you know, our planet is at a tilt. Did you know that tilt is actually changing? It always is changing, so far as long as we have observed. We can sometimes go to some great extremes, or we can come back up towards normal, to straight up and down, you could say. When you're at the greater extremes, you're going to have your poles 
farther away from the sun angled at times, so you'll get much more extreme winters. But also, the equator is going to be affected by that, so you're going to have much hotter summers as well. But as you come back more towards a perfect up and down, your climate moderates. It gets better. So, if we put it at the extremes, that can give us a period of when we have much colder climates, and we, that's one little ingredient to get a secular ice age. Another one is the actual precession. Not only are we tilted, but we're wobbling as we tilt, as we go around. And as that wobble gets more extreme, the more extreme the weather. The more it is straight up and down and not wobbling, the more moderate the climate is. By the way, on both of those, all we've observed thus far is our tilt is coming back up towards straight up and down. And our wobble right now is getting less and less. That's what's actually been observed. Another part of the ingredients for this is the absidial precession. So not only are we in this ellipse that goes around, but watch as it goes around here, it has its own little change in position as it goes around the sun as well, as you can see in the little illustration. If you, when you're on the farther extremes, more extreme climate, when you're not as far in the extreme, the more moderate the climate. And one more is the orbital inclination. Not Let's say this is the plane of our solar system, this table. Sometimes our orbit is like this as we go around the sun. Sometimes it's more level. In every one of these, you have to have all one, two, three, four, five happening at the same time to get the most extremes in the weather in order to get the idea of an ice age. Here's the problem with this. This is known as the Milakovic cycles. The problem is, in all of the calculations, no matter how much you adjust the math in all of this, never, never in the math can they get all five to happen at the exact same time. So there's still to this day, even though you'll see it taught, oh, the Milankovitch cycles, this is how you get a second an ice age, it doesn't add up. And never has. So it's still an issue for those who don't have a biblical worldview of how you get an ice age. But the thing that strikes me is in all of these things that we are observing, what is happening? Are they getting more extreme or less extreme? Less extreme. The tilt is coming back up. The orbit is going more circular. Our wobble is less. It's almost as if we are recovering. From something that happened. How many of you were here last night? Okay. How many of you remember the flood models? And the one major flood model that is used by a lot of creation ministry today was the, was the model proposed by Dr. John Bungard, catastrophic plate tectonics. And as you recall, when the fountains of the deep break forth, the continent, the supercontinent split apart. This is the idea. This is the model split apart, and the continents were moving how fast, do you recall? Meters per second. One calculation has the Indian subcontinent slamming into Asia, forming the Himalayan, Himalayan mountains. When it was doing that, it crashed into Asia going 60 miles an hour. That's how we get those mountains. When all this data was put into the model, Dr. John Bumgarner showed this was what happened to the planet. Remember, it, the one on the left is a fixed position in space. The other one on the right is if you were like on the moon in orbit. And the spin here is a little accelerated. It's counting by days. But remember, the red is the North Pole. The computer simulations show we did have our world turned upside down in this judgment of the global flood. What might you think that would do to our orbit, to our axis, ultimately to our climate? As I said, all these things, they're coming back up, and it looks like we're recovering from something. 
Now, one of the ways they get all these different ideas of, of these different ice ages is by these core samples, digging down, getting these ice cores, bring them up, and then they count the layers on them and say how many layers there are in these ice cores, as you dig up in Greenland or in Antarctica, that's how old that ice core is. Have we recently had any snow around here? Okay. It's believed that each one represents one year's worth of snowfall. The thing is, though, if we have snow, and then it begins to melt just a little bit, and then it refreezes, we have a new kind of crustal layer there. What if it would snow on top of that? Would you be able to tell the difference between those two layers? Yes or no? You could probably tell the difference between the layer that, has that, that was down first, then melt a little, then froze, then had snow on top of that, did we just have one or more or multiple layers in one in one year? Multiple layers. Guess what we've observed? Observe, test, or defalsify regarding ice cores. Multiple layers in a year. So we have to do some nice little tricking things to try to give definite ages to these core samples. Do you remember last night? How you date a fossil. If you dig one of these things up out of the ground, how do you give it its date? What do you do? Talk to me. What do you do? You check what layer of rock it's in. And what layer of rock it's in, that's how old that fossil is. Now, question. How do you know how old the rock is? By what fossil you found in. So whatever fossil you found in the rock, that's how old the rock is. You laugh at that, and so did I when I heard as a little, young, very, very long, young, little kid, when I first heard this Matt Miles guy come to church. I mean, I was young, very young the first time. <laughs> when he came and he spoke, and I heard him, I heard him share this kind of stuff. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. I'm sure, yeah, what? I, that's, okay, there's got to be more to it. There's got to be more to it. I'm sure it is. And then I went to university in Edwardsville, Illinois working on my history degree, and I'm sitting there in anthropology class where we're talking about digging up fossils, human fossils, and all that kind of stuff. And she literally stands there, my professor, her PhD, and says, we date the rocks by the fossils, we date the fossils by the rocks. And I'm waiting for the next part, and there wasn't one! And I thought that crazy that Miles was right. Could not look. It really is how that's done. Now, yeah, but here's the deal. They say the, the fossils date the rocks, but the rocks date the fossils better. Because here's what happened, and I've got a three-hour presentation on this. We're not doing it tonight. Um, <laughs> on how the, all these layers in this supposed geologic column, how that was all put together. I've studied the whole history of that. Yeah, that's, that gets the girls. Um, <laughs> All of these layers were given arbitrary, arbitrary dates as to how old each layer was. Guess what happened over time? When Darwin was writing his book, and he's working with Charles Lyell, who wrote his great three-volume vol uh, collection called Principles of Geology, he's telling Lyell, I need 300 million years. That's what I need for my idea of evolution to work. I need 300 million years. So guess what they did to the layers? They got 300 million years out of it. Just arbitrarily. Hmm. You know how old we have to say they are today? We have to get 4.3454, whatever it is now today, billion years out of it. A billion is a thousand millions. So we're talking 4,000 4, times arbitrarily put together. It's completely made. So we got to come up with little ideas. So the circular dating thing, the rocks take the fossil, fossils take the rocks. Guess what we do with ice cores? We date ice cores to what we find in tree rings. And we date tree rings by what we find in vars that we get out of the bottoms of lakes. And we date those by the ice cores, which we date by the tree rings, which we date by the vars, which we date by the ice cores, which we date by the... Am I getting confusing here? <laughs> oh, but we have carbon 14s. So we carbon date the tree rings. So that way we have that right. By the way, guess what we used to calibrate the carbon-14 dating? The tree rings. How many of you knew, knew any of this before? We did the tree rings by the carbon-14. We calibrated carbon-14 by the tree rings. 
This, it, this, this whole incestuous process is rampant in this worldview because we're trying to justify something that was first believed, but now we have to find a support for it. And it's not there. Whereas we have a solid rock upon which we stand. So, when you go down this path, it will take you places. You ever heard somebody say you have to check your brain at the door in order to come into a church? In order to be a Christian? Watch what happens here in this video clip when Bill Nye, doing a special for PBS, um, goes to Greenland in 2017. They aired this in April of uh, 2018. And watch what conclusion he has to come to because he's going down this path of every layer represents a year. And I have to believe that in order to believe in my millions and billions of years. Watch what happens here. This ice core sand. And he sees the whoa, I have no idea what's going on there. I'm sorry. Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know what just happened there. We are way out of this is white. I know. I can go through material way fast. Okay, stop. Okay. Okay. You see the ice core sample. You see this ash here. It's called tephra. That's from a volcano. But it's going through multiple layers, 15, 17. So Bill Nye, his worldview says each layer represents what? One year. So this volcano had to erupt for how long? 15, 17 years. And Bill Nye's first question is, is that possible? Why does he ask that question? What have we never, ever seen? A volcano erupt for 17 years. So what's going on here? Well, can a volcano do that? Is the next question we must ask. So what is the longest we have on record of volcan volcanic activity? 
Okay? Well, there are volcanoes that are constantly just kind of flowing out. Effusive volcanoes, lava just kind of coming out, just, just flowing, all right? Um, the one in volcano in uh, Hawaii, how do you say that one? Kil Kil Kilauea? Okay. Kilauea, all right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right, that one started erupting January 3rd, 1983, and went to September 4th, 2018. 35.7 years. Pretty cool. So, hey, maybe Bill Nye's right. It could do that. Problem. What are we actually seeing in the ice sample there? Ash, tephra. Guess what those kind of volcanoes do not put out? They don't put out tephra. They don't put out the ash. We need an explosive volcano in order to do that. An explosive one. The... Um, the one pictured here is from uh, is from uh, Mount Pinatuba from the Philippines, 20th century. All right, so we saw that one explode. The second one known uh, in history. There have been many of those. You know, Pompeii was one of them. Mount Saint Helens was one of those. That shows you kind of the uh, the uh, comparison there about how much tephra they put out in cubic miles of ejecta. So Mount St. Helens was a quarter mile of ejecta of tephra going out, whereas Mount T uh, Tambora, which was in 1815 in Indonesia, put out 19 cubic miles of that. That is the largest one ever recorded. Thousands of people uh, died from that. The, the eruption could be heard 1,200 miles away. 1,200 miles away. It caused, it actually lowered the global temperature almost 1.3 degrees just because of how much ash was put in the atmosphere from that one volcano. One volcano, one, lowered the whole global temperature 1.3 degrees. You have what followed after that called the, uh, the black winter and the year without a summer. And we, you had snow in times when... <laughs> Uh, in New York and Maine, they were having snow in June. You could, in New York, go out on a perfectly sunny day and look directly at the sun and not hurt you because of the fog that was over. It caused a major decrease in crop production. There was a great migration that happened from the New England area that came into the Midwest and settled a lot of places from that. This was all from one volcano. How long did it go, though? It lasted a total of, if you count from the very first explosion to the very end when a little bit was still coming out, it lasted a grand total of 140 days, or 0.38 years. That's the biggest ever recorded. So when Bill Nye looks at that piece over there, his worldview demands... Because he's got to have every layer of earth in a year, demands he believes in a volcano that erupted for 15 to 17 years. When we use actual science, observational, testable, repeatable, plus Bible science, the longest we've ever seen was a third of a year. Which one has to check their brain at the door? Okay, so how do we get all these layers out of this? Because here's one of the things. As you get farther down in it, there's all this pressure that happens and has caused the ice layers to thin so much you can't count them anymore. You get all this thinning. You know, speaking of thinning, I come from a family of men that have very thin hairlines. So that's kind of one thing I notice from time to time. And so I'm standing in the back, and Eric comes up here, and, and I see it. Man, he's got some thick hair. And I'm like, man, that's really, that's really cool. And so I'm standing by his, his lovely wife, the Korea there, and I said, uh, man, Eric, he's got some thick hair, you know? He's, does he have like a secret that comes with that? And she's like, yeah, it comes with a really thick skull. And, <laughs> I mean, 
thin. So these layers are getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and you can't count them anymore. But we've got to make them be really, really, really old because we've got to say that they keep going and can help our world view that the Earth is millions and billions of years old. So how do we do that? <laughs> I'll show you. The Center for Ice and Climate will tell you this. Computer models can be used to estimate the age along an ice core. The models describe the flow of the ice by taking into account the annual amount of snow in the past and the thinning of the annual layers as they are being compressed by the weight of the snow and ice cloud. The computer can take into account the annual amount of snow. How does the computer know how much snow came down that year? Somebody put it in there. Were we there to observe a snowfall 14,000 years ago? Hmm. Interesting. In the, why is it doing that? I don't know. It's doing that. I just pushed it once. Okay, let's see. Hey, oh, what? Right there. Right there. Okay, time for a near moment. In the central Antarctic ice cores where the annual layer is non existent, the annual layering is non-existent or unreliable due to extremely low accumulation rates. Time scale modeling is often the only option while most Greenland cores to some extent can be dated by annual layer counting. So sometimes those layers aren't even there. I'm just gonna use this thing. Did that work? Yeah. And the other part, the time scale is established by counting annual layers. So we count the layers where we can see them, but eventually the layers become too thin identified and counted, and the time scale further down has to be established from what? Computer models by whatever data we program into it. Interesting. The basic assumption behind the model, assum assumptions? <laughs> there are assumptions in I, Does that sound like good science? Behind the model is that the horizontal velocity of the ice can be considered constant. You haven't heard something about constant rates and assumptions recently, have you? You thought radiometric dating was the only thing. It's everywhere. From surface and down to a certain depth, and that it from there on decreases linearly with depth. Time scale modeling is, in this case, used to obtain a preliminary time scale before the ice core has been drilled and analyzed. When do we determine how old this ice core is? Before we even drilled it. Before the ice core has been drilled and analyzed and for dating the deeper parts of the ice where the annual layers get too thin to be safely identified. Well, how about that? So we don't have a secular good explanation for this. Does the Bible provide us an explanation for an ice age? Because the data is very, very good that there was an ice age. But that's what we would say. An ice age. One ice age. And yes, it does seem that we can get a very good biblical model, a Bible-based model for an ice age. When the fountains of the great deep burst forth, we have all this massive volcanic activity. Volcanoes are a little hot. What's that going to do to the oceans? It's going to make them warm. And from there on, all kinds of stuff is going to happen. So, we have... All this volcanic activity happening. It's going to heat the oceans. We have these oceans that are going to be then, when you heat water, what does it do? It evaporates. So we're going to have a great deal of evaporation going up in there. And then as it comes over onto the, the, uh, the, the continents, which are going to be a little cooler, it's going to start precipitating. Now, here's the deal. Do you remember how much did that one volcano, Mount Tamara, how much did it lower the planet's temperature? About 1.3 degrees. Because of how much ash was put in the atmosphere blocking the sunlight. When they all go off, 
What's that going to do to our temperature? Ooh, we're going to have a great reduction in the temperature. It's going to be much colder. So when that precipitation then moves over the continents, what kind of precip is it going to be? Snow. Oh, do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> and just like that, we lost our feet. Okay. Um, it's going to come down to snow. Here's the deal. Are we going to have a warm enough summer to melt all of it off? No. Which means two things. We're still going to have snow when the next winter comes, and we'll all of it have melted and gone right back into the oceans. No. So over a few hundred years of this, what's going to happen to the ocean levels? They're going to go down, and what's going to happen to the level of snow and ice on the continents? It's going to go on and up and up and up over time. The best models by these brilliant scientists who do this say that, the, I mean, this starts right after the flood, okay, right? This is a direct result of the flood, and therefore this proceeds about three to 500 years, peaks somewhere around three to 500 years, this ice age does. And then begins to finally start going away as things start getting normalized. The weather, the weather is trying to figure itself out because this is a whole new planet, pretty much. And all these new jet streams and ocean currents and stuff, it's figuring this all out. It's still figuring it out to this day. And finally starts to go away about around 700 years or so after the flood. That's the idea. It's interesting, the book of Job... Written maybe somewhere around the time of Abraham, which would be right during this time of Ice Age. <coughs> Job writing somewhere around the Middle East, from whose womb has come the ice and the frost of heaven, who has given it birth. Water becomes hard like stone, and the surface of the deep is imprisoned. He says more about snow and ice than anyone else in Scripture. And his would date to this time of the Ice Age. Now, when I say the Ice Age, I don't mean that it was snowing in Israel all the time. But it would be a very lush climate at that time. It would be, it would be, not, it would be desert and arid during this period. But he probably would, would have heard of people traveling to all the snow and ice. About 30% of the planet covered in the snow and ice of the Ice Age. About 30%. So Israel would be very lush. If you go to Israel today, I went in 2010, down in the southern part of it, very dry, very arid. It's a desert. But do you remember how it was described when the children of Israel first went in? What was it? Milk and honey. Milk and honey. Lush all throughout. That's because it would have been during this time. When it was ending, and it still would have been a moderate climate there, lots of precip, would have been very lush. It, it all works beautifully, as if the Bible is trustworthy or something. <laughs> now, one thing we need to answer, because the Ice Age plays into this, is when you have a biblical worldview about the flood and about creation, what day of history were the dinosaurs created? On what day? Sixth day, land animals, created on day six, okay? The pteranodon, being a flying reptile, would have been created on what number day? Five. And the Tylosaurus over here, being a marine reptile, would have been on what day? Five, okay. And what day was man created? Day six. So the Bible gives us the understanding that we were made the same day as the dinosaurs, we therefore would have lived with them. When we come to the flood, what's Noah supposed to have on the ark? Two of, Two of every kind, seven pairs of the clean animals. So what then should have been on the ark? Dinosaurs. Could they have fit? Yes. <laughs> See Mr. Edmontosaurus here? Mr. Edmontosaurus here? Okay. Um, when these guys get full size, his hind leg can reach about 10 to 12 feet. Big guy. You know how big his egg was? Got one right here. And Montessori's egg. That big. But when he's born, how big is he? 
He's not a cute little thing. Even the sauropods, long neck, long tails, the biggest ones, their, their, their eggs are the size of soccer balls. Are you going to take large reptiles on the ark? No, because large reptiles, how old are they? They're pretty old when they're large, because reptiles grow their whole life. When they get off the ark, what are they supposed to do? Have babies. So you're going to take old animals on the ark. No, you're going to take juveniles. You're going to take young ones so they can reproduce afterwards. Cuts down on the size, on the room. Cuts down on the amount of food you need to have for all of them. So that, yes, the dinosaurs can fit no problem. They all fit no problem. That means after the flood, what should we expect to find? Dinosaurs living again. Let me tell you, I have a whole fun presentation on this, but I'll just tell you this. From a historical standpoint, going back and studying human interaction with dinosaurs, it is phenomenal. The mountains of records and evidence of people living with dinosaurs is phenomenal. My favorite book on the table is this one right here. It's called Dire Dragons, done by Vance Nelson. He went all around the world and took pictures of ancient depictions of dinosaurs. And then came home, got a professional computer generation company that makes dinosaurs for like uh, TV specials for History Channel or Smithsonian or National Geographic. And says, I didn't tell him what you had that home. He says, hey, can you make me this particular dinosaur, this color, this position? Do it anatomically correct based on the fossil record. Got it, took it home, put it side by side with what he collected. As a whole book on that. So then the question always is, well, what happened to them then? Why aren't they alive today? All of this plays in to ideas about why the dinosaurs went extinct. Usually the typical answer of why they went extinct is what? There was an asteroid that came and struck the planet and killed them. Okay? There's all kinds of problems with that. But let me just tell you my favorite story on that. I was at the University of Oklahoma going through their big fossil museum and looking at everything they had there. And this lady was following us around, and we get to the point where it talks about the extinction of the dinosaurs. And she said, would you like to know how the dinosaurs went extinct? And I'm standing there with my father-in-law and his family. We were taking them through. And I said, I sure would. <laughs> So she's pretty good to tell. Now, she had been working with the museum and doing fossil digs and stuff for like 30-some years. We heard the whole history of that, too. She finally got to the idea, the asteroid. He said, here's what happens. This big asteroid is coming towards the planet. It's heading towards the Yucatan Peninsula. It's going to strike right there. I said, I know it sounds scary. And then she said, okay, when it strikes, it sends up this huge explosion, massive tidal waves, and, and heat and everything, incinerates everything very close to within a certain 100-mile radius. I said, oh, this sounds terrifying. And then she said, and then you had all of this debris, this ejecta that went up into the atmosphere, and now the bad stuff's going to happen. I said, oh, hide the kids. And here it came. This ejected then spread around the whole globe. What happens when stuff comes down through the atmosphere? Catches fire? You have these innumerable amounts of fire projectiles then that are raining down on the planet. All other life forms we're smart enough to go and hide in their holes and caves in the ground. But the dinosaurs were like people from southern Missouri when a tornado happens. Let's go outside and watch. <laughs> you think she's the only one? Check this out from Smithsonian Channel. The asteroid was six miles wide. Weighed hundreds of billions of tons. Still, compared to Earth, it was tiny. How could it wreak such havoc? It would have hit at nearly 50,000 miles per hour. The 
energy released would be equal to about 100 million nuclear bombs. A huge mass of superheated debris would have been blasted into space, orbiting the Earth before raining back down. The algorithms thought the dust could have blocked out the sun for years, devastating life. This was the hypothesis for how the age of dinosaurs ended. Anybody ever thought it was weird that everything else survived except dinosaurs? Well, that's not the only idea. Because of how problematic that one is, there actually been proposed at least 22 different ideas on how dinosaurs went extinct. In 2012, History Channel said that uh, aliens manipulated dinosaur DNA, <laughs> they ended up causing them to go extinct. That or aliens visited and they had a virus or pathogen that killed only dinosaurs. And, um, 20, or 1960 something, I can't see the note. Caterpillars ate all the food that dinosaurs eat, vegetarian dinosaurs eat, and therefore they went extinct, and therefore the meat eaters went extinct because then they didn't have the other ones to eat. That, that, yep, that's, that's a legitimate one. This one uh, said that they developed cataracts and therefore couldn't find their food and went extinct. <laughs> uh, sorry, I can't see my notes, it's not working for me. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, and that was 1982, okay. Then, there we go. This was proposed by our call, by uh, Matt Miles here, because uh, of his love for coffee. <laughs> a, but here's one of my favorites. This one was legitimately proposed, and uh, let's see here. 2012, calculating um, sauropod dinosaurs and how much flatulence they produce and what that would have done to the atmosphere that would have choked them off and eventually they would extinct from that. <laughs> you can't make this up. So, Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley says this, there has been no settlement to the issue so far and no clear one is foreseeable. The main problem is the issue of the selectivity of the mass extinction. Some organisms were wiped out while others were unaffected. So yeah, again, back to the whole thing, why is it only, only dinosaurs that went extinct? Other major problems with the issue are that it is not easy to prove or test causation and that most of the ages of the rocks that different evidence comes from are questionable. I about fell out of my chair when I read that part of it. Did you just admit what I think you, yes you did. All the ages of the rocks are questionable, interesting. Ultimately, they said, we just don't know yet for sure. <laughs> As I said, with a biblical worldview, biblical model, we have these dinosaurs that come off the ark, they would reproduce, and in certain areas, they would be able to survive. You have about 30% of the planet that is covered. This area here, the Sarah Desert, would have been lush. All, there's good evidence that shows that. By the way, our, we because of this, our timeline... It's one of the only ones uh, that I know of, and that's why I want to put on it, where you have that ice age on there. And when an ice age, when the ice age ends, all the data says it would have been followed by a period of droughts and famines. <laughs> when you put it on here, according to the models, it comes right down here. It's right when there's this guy named Joseph in Egypt. Isn't that interesting? Huh. There have been periods then, since then, of of very major variances in climate since the ice age with the biblical ice age around 2300 to 1700s would have been then there was this warming period from the 1700s to 975 then there was the sub atlantic cold period from 975 to 250 the roman warm period 250 to ad the dark ages cold period 450 to 950 the medieval warm period 950 to 1400 the little ice age from 1400 to 1815 
And now we're in the current climate phase of 1850 on. What we see, and this is a major research project that I've been doing a little bit off and on, and, and what it's been adding up from what I can tell is all of these records that we have of people interacting with dinosaurs, because these dinosaurs are reptiles, they need a decently warm climate, we assume, to be able to, to function. Guess where we find them at? In the records in history. We find them corresponding to where the warmer periods are during all these different ages of warming and cooling, warming and cooling. But what we also see is that over time, the amount of records keeps dwindling and dwindling and dwindling until about the last reliable ones. I, there are a lot of them out there that I don't consider reliable. I, I tried to hold these, these ideas. Oh, that was a dinosaur. And it's got to be a pretty high standard uh, criteria there for, to, for me to, to consider it legitimate. But the very last ones we see are around the 1400s, possibly late 1400s. So time of Columbus. Maybe a few into the 1500s as well. We have some in the 1500s, possibly. So you're getting close to almost, by the time of the pilgrims, we're, we're done. The, the very last ones that have made it through that long, the dinosaurs reproducing, uh, they're pretty much extinct by that time. That seems to be what fits the evidence. Now, we've been covering all this, and so here's where I want to kind of bring us to to finish up tonight. What do you see as an observable data has been going on with our climate? It goes through major cycles. Because, from a biblical perspective, it's still trying to figure itself out. It's still recovering from the flood. And it's getting better at times, and then sometimes it gets a little wacky. It's pretty crazy. So we see, we take these things and we chart them, and we can see warming periods and cooling periods and warming periods and cooling. These are a whole bunch of lines of different temperature data going on. And so you have that little ice age that ended around 1850, and then since then we are in what is considered to be the current climate pattern, you could say, or climate age. So which is it? Is it going to be a warming one or a cooling one? Well, the idea is it should be a warming one if we continue this pattern of warming, cooling, warming, cooling, warming, cooling. It should be warming. Okay? And after 1850, we did see that for a while. It did begin to warm, as you can see there. It kind of comes up and almost peaks out around 1998 or so. And it's about as warm as the medieval warm period. Okay, so nothing that had been seen before. But in 1998, we had this thing going on that was called El Nino. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Okay, El Nino. That is a regularly occurring phenomenon, El Nino is. El Nino is the warming part. La Nina is the cooling part. It's an oceanic uh, current phase that it goes through from time to time. And so we're supposed to be in this, this warming trend. And in the 1930s, whoo, did we have a warming trend. And from 1930 to 1938, major, major warming trend. We had the era of the Dust Bowl. We had 1934, which is considered to be the hottest year in U.S. history. Followed, secondly, by 1936. Major, major warming periods during that time. But then, the 1970s came. Who remembers the weather in the 1970s? Ice age coming. <laughs> it got so cold, so bad. My dad was in Bible college at the time, and he said when guys would go up the hill to, to the classrooms from the dorm, if they hadn't dried their hair completely, when they got up to the, to the classroom, their hair would have frozen and could break right off. Which I asked if that's where the thinning of our hair came from. And he said that. <laughs> but... It got so cold, watch this, watch this little clip from, from, uh, from, uh, In Search of, 1978. In 1977, the worst winter in a century struck the United States. Arctic cold ripped the Midwest for weeks on end. 
great blizzard to paralyze the cities of the Northeast. One desperate night in Buffalo, eight people froze to death in maroon cars. Pat Bushnell was on the road that night. Pat had just absolutely stopped. I was afraid of being stuck in the car all night long with the uh, cold and the wind running out of gas. And then what? I think that if we had to go through a real bad winter, just like we just went through, I think we'd have to think about moving someplace else. Move where? The brutal buffalo winter might become common all over the United States. So, the climate experts believe the next ice age is on its way. According to recent evidence, it could come sooner than anyone can expect. At weather stations in the far north, temperatures have been dropping for 30 years. Seacoast, long free of summer ice, are now blocked year-round. According to some climatologists, within a lifetime, we might be living in the next ice age. You get politics. That's it. That's all you get. So there became this big push to have government start taking actions regarding regulations on all kinds of stuff, on all kinds of industries in order to fight global cooling. Well, then we had 1998 happen, and we had a major increase in temperature with the El Nino event. Guess what happened? In the 1990s. And there's a little bit going in the 80s, but guess what happened in the 1990s then? We have this new big push that we need government to take action to save us from what? Global warming. That peaked in 2006 with the release of a particular movie. If I remember what movie came out in 2006 about global warming. What? An Inconvenient Truth by Vice President Al Gore. Anybody ever see it? Oh, well, just for you, I happen to have a clip of it. <laughs> Here you go. A little clip from Al Gore's 2006 An Inconvenient Truth.
Interesting thing, though, according to some studies, such as by the Global Warming Policy Foundation, um, they contend that since about 1998 or so, we've gone 23 years now with a pause in the warming. There hasn't been a major increase, hasn't made a major decrease. It's just kind of plateaued for about the last 23 years or so. Uh, you can read all about that in the uh, 2018 and 2019 uh, climate reports. 2020 obviously isn't out yet because they're still accumulating data. And they weren't the only ones. In 2016, a peer-reviewed journal in Nature Climate Change, the journal Nature Climate Change, uh, admitted in 2016 that there had been a slowdown, there had been a hiatus, there had not been any major warming going on for almost two decades, since 1998. And then something happened at the beginning of 2020. Glacier National Park had to replace a lot of their signs because the signs said they are now rapidly shrinking due to human-caused climate change. Computer models indicate that glaciers will all be gone by the year 2020. <laughs> all caused by human climate change. Human-caused climate change, anthropogenic climate change. We are polluting so much, we're causing the planet to warm, and therefore we will have no more glaciers to see in Glacier National Park by the year 2020. Those signs have now been replaced. It's, it's interesting. Pay attention to where they're talking about ice sheets and glaciers and ice coverage. Because here's what we've seen for the last 20, actually since 1979, measuring this since 1979, Greenland and the Arctic ice sheet has been shrinking. But guess what's been happening on the other side? The Antarctic ice sheet has been increasing, has been growing. This was a report by the Daily Mail. Global warming computer models confounded as Antarctic ice, sea ice hits new record high with 2.1 million square kilometers, more than is usual for the time of year. And, and it just continues. This is the uh, February 19th, 2021 measurement of the Arctic, I Antarctic sea ice extent. At the, in November, just this past November, we were at one of the highest ranges of how much ice there was in Antarctica ever, ever recorded. And then we kind of went along with the trend, and right now we're right here along with the, still, the same trend, the median average of Arctic ice in there. But the Greenland, the Arctic in the north, it has been shrinking, except until just a few weeks ago. And now it's the highest it's been, how much ice there is in the North Pole is the most there's been in 10 years. It's been a little cold lately. Anybody notice? Goodness, it's been cold. So, in the news, in January, how, how was weather in January? It was nice, wasn't it? It was pretty warm, but it was nice. We, in, in Oklahoma, we're having some 60s. We're out on the, the kids are out on the trampoline in their shorts in January. I'm like, this is great. This is really cool. But then, and so, the ice coverage of the Great Lakes was considered to be in great peril. Oh no, the global warming is affecting us. We're going to lose all the ice. This is not good. The, the, the Great Lakes aren't covered. Um, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab said ice coverage is only at 30%. It's supposed to be up to 53.3%. This is not good. Obviously, we're, we're all going to die from global warming. That was this January. Here's the latest news. Great Lakes ice cover is currently stands at 42%. Then there was one ice cover increases dramatically with Great Lakes. Then we've got Lake Erie at 81% coverage. <laughs> Just like that, it completely turned on a dime. Huge difference in 12 days. You can see the differences there, the increases of all the Great Lakes. Everything comes around in a circle, right? Yeah. Guess what some of the latest ideas are. This is from February 7, 2019. Extremely low sunspot counts indicate global cooling is beginning to onset again. <laughs> Guess what we may be heading towards again. If you think there's this consensus on climate change, there has been 
a global warming petition project that's been going on for, I can't even hardly remember now how many years, scientists who have signed their name saying they do not believe in human cause global warming. Which, by the way, global warming is no longer appropriate to use. We're supposed to use climate change because uh, what, what are we seeing? This petition project has been signed by uh, over 31,000 scientists, over 9,000 have PhDs. In that 9,000, 3,800 of them have atmospheric, environmental, earth science PhDs. Um, 5,812 have physics and aerospace PhDs. And 935 of them have computer mathematical PhDs. Why is that important? Because how does global warming or climate change um, determined? Computer models. Not by always observational data, but by future model predictions. Now you've heard though, maybe politicians use the statistic that 97% of scientists agree that there is global warming. Who's ever heard that? 97% believe there's global warming. Does anybody know where that statistic comes from? Dr. John Cook, 2013, wrote this article, did this in-depth study, quantifying the consensus on as Virginia global warming in scientific literature. So you want to look at all the scientific papers that are published and see how many scientists support the idea or how many of the papers support the idea that there is man-made global warming. And his number was 97% of the say so. So that's a consensus. That's a scientific consensus. But when we look into it a little bit more, here's what he said. We analyzed, and this is directly from his paper, we analyzed the evolution of the scientific consensus on man-made global warming in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, examining 11,944 climate abstracts from 1991 to 2011. Among the abstracts, expression of position on, the, on global warming, 97.1% endorsed the consensus. So there's what he said. They looked at 11,944 papers. But then he admitted a web of science search for climate change over the same period of years produced 43,548 papers, and then a search on this climate yielded 128,440. So he looked at maybe 9% of all papers that have ever been published to get his 97%. But even then, <laughs> Just put a not that that doesn't mean he can't do good research. Just a little side note. Of that, of those eleven thousand nine hundred and forty-four papers, Dr. David Henson, who has a PhD in economics from UCLA, so he does a lot of statistical analysis, he went through all of them as well that Dr. Cook had, and here was his final conclusion. Dr. Hansen concludes that the scientists in these papers quote from him, who think the main cause is humans is, drum roll please, this exact quote, 1.6% of scientists. It's a little far from 97, isn't it? Rather, 67.38% of climate scientists say we don't know or we're not causing it. What's the actual scientific consensus? We don't know. Or we're not the cause. I have a feeling that's not what you're going to hear in the media and in public debate over the next few years. The reason, one of the reasons why I've really studied this and looked into it is because I was somewhat inspired by my grandfather to do so. In 1965, my grandfather and grandmother over in Illinois Southeastern Illinois, this little farming couple had 100 acres they farm. He had, was approached by somebody who said, hey, I've got a brother who lives in Florida. He's got a grove. He grows Florida oranges. How about we bring some up to you and you sell them and whatever you don't sell, he'll, he'll, he'll buy it back from you. That's a win-win situation, isn't it? They said, we were looking for somebody, and we thought, you'd be the one who would want to do it. <laughs> so he said, sure, I'll try that. And so he did. And on the ticket, it said, harvest to home citrus fruit. Uh, this past year, 
uh, was the completion of 56 years of doing that. 56 seasons, 55, 56 seasons of doing that. Um, he stopped doing it uh, in 2018, and, uh, and I was doing it when we were in Illinois, and now my cousin is still doing it, so the family business is still going on. So I've been raised around Florida Citrus my whole life. I love Florida Citrus. I, I've learned all about it. I know a lot of the, the business that goes on down in Florida. And so, uh, in fact, here's a here's a, a little picture of me with my grandfather. And, uh, he, <laughs> this is why the people actually like me, Matt. Anyway, and, uh, and there I am in one of the fruit boxes, okay? And, and he would get entire semi loads in at a time. He had a whole semi that would come to his garage that he turned into a storefront about every two weeks. Starting from Thanksgiving, going all the way until there was like no more citrus. I mean, sometimes he'd go into March or April. Uh, people come to buy it, all right? I mean, it, it, it was really a, a neat little thing that we did. And then there's me doing it uh, with my grandfather and my son doing the traditional ride down the tracks as we unload the semi. Okay, it's really, really <coughs> kind of thing. Um, and he, uh, he just passed away this uh, last September uh, from pneumonia uh, just a couple of weeks before he was supposed to get his pneumonia shot. Uh, kind of 92 years old, and uh, it, 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 it was wonderful though because we knew it was happening, and so everybody had a chance to call and visit and see him all that stuff. So it, it, it was, it, it was, it was, it was really good to have it all. And, um, my uncle, who's a minister as well, he said, "Dad, you get ready to go see Jesus," and he said, "Yeah, sure hope he's not mad at me for anything." And so, <laughs> can you not on his deathbed? That's what he said. It was great. So. That was great. I get it honestly. Okay. So anyway, here's one of the things that, that was interesting. In the 1950s, in Claremont, Florida, on Highway 27, they built what was called the Citrus Tower. And it was one of the prime attractions in Central Florida, just north of Orlando. And uh, it was 22 stories high, 226 feet. It was on the highest a hill in that area, Claremont, Florida. And the cool thing was, you had 15,000 visitors a year. You could ride the elevator all the way to the top. And there's me taking my family there uh, a few years ago. And there's an old brochure of me. You used to be able to go all the way to the very top. They don't let you do that now. There's the observation of that area. And you could see orange groves from miles and miles. As far as you can see, you can see orange groves. Here's a picture. A picture from 1983. View of Highway 27, looking north. Here's a picture we took in 2011. No orange groups can be seen. Here's another uh, picture taken in 1983 as well, looking south, or that may be uh, that may be east. I think it's south. And here is what it looks like in 20. So you can see the orange rooms, literally as far as you can see. There is zero commercial, commercial level orange groves, growing oranges, um, from Claremont on north. And when my grandfather started in the 50s, you could get commercial oranges all the way up to Ocala, Florida, which is in the northern part. None of that's happening anymore. Guess why? Well, land development, all the people moving in, you know, everybody's selling their, their farms, you know. And, uh, yeah, well, what happened in the 80s was when you go into the Citrus Tower and you go around the little gift shop there, they have a whole presentation, a nice little, you know, <coughs> thing they put together about the most damaging decade in the history of the Florida citrus industry in the 1980s. Cold snap. So much so, you had ice hanging off of the oranges. And you had Polk County, actually, you had Lake County up here, where the Citrus Tower is, go from 132,000 acres to 99, and Lake County, I'm sorry, Lake County up here, go from 122,000 down to 13,900 in just a matter of a decade. 
So Cal is up here. Used to get Florida citrus all the way up there. Today, the citrus belt is completely down here, pretty much Orlando or south. Most of it's south, around Dundee, Lake Hamilton, and on farther down. You can't, you can't. And the reason is, is because the average temperature since the 80s has been too cold to commercially grow. They grow now in those areas, the guys who still have the land, they grow strawberries and blueberries and peaches. 2019, Florida outproduced Georgia in peaches. They've had to completely change because the climate has become too cold. There's a town called Frostproof. Guess what happens there now? <laughs> okay, so here we go. We're done. We're done. But why is this important? Why, why talk about this? Especially this whole thing about climate change. Two reasons. One is the impact it has on lives. Anybody see what's happening in Texas? Yeah, we're, we're next door in Oklahoma. It's been pretty rough on down there. There's been a big debate going back and forth. Is it because of renewable energies like solar and wind especially? Wind power... The wind turbines in Texas make up 23% of Texas energy. 13% of all that, of all the energy, so um, 10%, they lost 10%. 13% went down. So almost all of them went down because they weren't winterized, they couldn't handle it. And so that created a backlog then on the electric grids, they couldn't keep going or anything. But all the other ones on the coal and, and the natural gas, they had pipes freezing everything, they had to winterize. Supposed to, especially since 2011 in the cold snap, but they've not been winterizing because normally you don't have this kind of weather in Texas. But now this is multiple times within a decade that this has happened. I'm not blaming either one. I'm not going to go there. All I'm going to say is we better make sure we know what we're doing. Yeah. Because there are lives at stake and more, more concerned about their political careers. You know what happens when you mix politics with climate policy? You have politicians in the dark. <laughs> okay, that, that was a bad one, but it's the truth, all right? You don't think this is, this is serious stuff. And we need to pay attention to what our elected officials are doing. Last Sunday, or a week ago Sunday, on Valentine's Day, Christian Panetta went outside from his home for about 40 miles north of Houston and played in the snow for the first time in his life. They just moved from Honduras a couple years earlier. So excited. This is his, his mother, Maria, looking at pictures of him playing in the snow. He came in that Sunday... He only played out there in half an hour. But they lived in a single wide trailer had very poor insulation, about 40 years old. This is what she was saying. And that night is when the power went off. And then that morning when she went to wake him, he had died from supposedly hypothermia because the temperature got in single digits. I'm just saying we need to be aware and paying attention to what's going on. And make sure we're doing things that are beneficial for humanity. Because from a biblical worldview, humanity is the crown jewel of God's creation. He says so in Colossians. He says so in Ephesians 2. You are his masterpiece. Created for his works. The other, and the other reason is this. I talked to a young man one time. He's in high school, and he said, and he has a proper biblical worldview. He said, but all my friends are just terrified. They live in absolute fear that our planet is going to not be able to support life within 10 years or 9 years or 12 years or whatever the latest number is. There's no reason for that. See, one of the ideas is that it's not just that it's not that the average temperature is going up, global warming, but climate change, we're having more severe weather patterns. That's what happens with climate change. The historical data, we've been having major cold waves or heat waves since we've been collecting data. Since we've been collecting data. It happens. 
We have these extremes that happen from time to time because our plan is still trying to figure itself out. Our hope is not in a climate policy. It's not in the election. It's not in the vaccine. It's not in anything this world has. We need not fear. You know what the scriptures assure us of? When they come off the ark, God said, as long as the earth remains, as long as I allow it to stay here, you're going to have seed time and harvest. You're going to have cold and heat. You're going to have summer and winter. Day and night, they shall not cease. You can't do anything about it. May God bless on his sons and send them be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Live your lives in a way that glorifies him. May God spoke to no one to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I myself am establishing this covenant with you and with your descendants after Is this still in effect today? Yes. <laughs> God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. That's you, that's me. And it shall serve. I have set, what's the sign? I've set my rainbow. And I thought, do we still have rainbows today? Yes. Amen. And it shall serve as a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. We do not place our hope in science, in policies, in any individual of this earth. We place it in, we don't place it in anything. My hope is built on nothing less and Jesus' blood and righteousness. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. And I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. Amen. Would you sing that with me? On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Heavenly Father, we glorify you tonight for you and you alone are worthy. We praise your holy name. We place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Thank you. We need not worry what this fallen world throws at us. We stand on the rock. Thank you that your word always stands true upon that foundation truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we shall take our stand and we shall live our lives in ways that glorify your name so that when people see us, they might see the love and the joy of Jesus. May we be covered with your grace and your mercy. And may we extend it to a world that is dying have the life, life everlasting, through Jesus. In his glorious name we pray. And the church said, Amen. We have many resources on this, on these materials. Uh, feel free to come check them out. We'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. And right away, it's the next couple of nights. Matt's going to be speaking on the heavens declare tomorrow night. So I'm guessing somewhere in, I don't know, Genesis 12, moving on, above the stars, and stuff like that. Okay. So uh, again, tomorrow is the heavens declare. And then Wednesday, special night, are you going to be, be getting a lesson on dinosaurs and anybody else who might sneak in the bag? For Matt, that wasn't me. So, okay. So again, you guys, thank you so much. Don't forget to, to check out the tables for resources. Um, you know, if you got questions, talk to these guys. They said they love answering those questions. So you got them, shoot them at them, and they will try to give you the best answer that they can in the moment. God bless, guys. Have a great night.